have you actually seen it work in particular for fibromyalgia? Oh yeah, you have yeah yeah, yeah. good because really well. how 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 does it work? What because that's one condition I you know I I just I'm still I see most people suffering with you know among many but yeah can you talk a bit about how how drastic the effect can be and you know well it varies I mean everyone's kind of unique as we know um, but I've definitely I mean I've seen a lot of patients over the years who have improved significantly with fibromyalgia and medical cannabis mm. um fibromyalgia you know it's one of those very kind of difficult to treat conditions mm. um there's often a strong interplay between um physical symptoms of pain but it's often also kind of associated with chronic fatigue brain mm. fog you know tiredness kind of general malaise and uh and that in in turn might affect someone's mood so like often patients with fibromyalgia suffer with suffering with anxiety or depression or they're struggling with to keep up with their home life or their work and so on so it's a it can be a devastating diagnosis for some patients because um you know like it affects more than just pain right it affects kind of often the overall quality of life for mm. these patients and the treatment options are limited so the classic pathway that i see patient first presents to their gp mm. there might be a question at that point of fibromyalgia then they they might be referred to a pain clinic or a rheumatologist rheumatologist does a load of blood tests and says oh you've not got rheumatoid arthritis you've not got autoimmune mm. not got xyz um so what can we do you will refer you to like a fibromyalgia program or if, if there is one pain manager. If, if there is one yeah, in their area yeah so they wait what another six months or a year they're seen yeah. and then it's some talking therapies or pain management and so on but Fundamentally, they're often still suffering. In the meantime, they might have been prescribed amitriptyline or duloxetine. Um, again, some patients might benefit, others others perhaps won't. So what are they supposed to do, some of these hmm. people, right? Uh, they feel often they're poorly understood. The symptoms aren't. That they might not be taken seriously in some cases by hmm. people around them and so on. So, um, so this is where I think we need to think outside the box a bit as doctors and, and actually... You know, can it, medical cannabis often in oil form is really effective. It helps a bit with sleep and pain and, and mood and kind of has that subtle effect on things. Prescribe a lot of flour for patients to vaporize, mm. fibromyalgia. Um, and it can help along with all the other things that we know, good nutrition, graded exercise, you know, meditation, breathing, uh, breath work. There's loads of other things that can help. And I just think medical cannabis can be part of that picture. Mm part of that uh formulary of the, of options that might help so that's why it's such a shame it's kind of not accessible in the nhs and it's not mm. widely accepted i mean nice nice who provide us with guidelines within the nhs on prescribing have said there's no role for cannabis medical cannabis in the treatment of chronic pain mm. whereas there's thousands of papers <laughs> scientific papers that show it's actually really effective the americans have kind of made their own conclusions up mm. about it Mm. so um we've got this kind of dichotomy of like one person saying one thing another person saying the other thing whereas right in the middle of it is a patient that might be suffering who can actually access a treatment that is legal mm. it's safe you know it's well tolerated um but they're kind of missing out because it's not available in the nhs it's not kind of endorsed by the regulators mm. for the, for those particular things so yeah definitely well, fibromyalgia is yeah I, I mean i touch on fibro fibromyalgia because it's and you know i guess you can look at that with me because it's one of those things that you know as a doctor you're almost dreaded for the patient to come and we see him on your list right because you think you know what what can what am i going to be able to do you know in 10 15 minutes you know and, and one thing that i have been looking at a lot is, is is medical cannabis and it's a shame you know that it's not available on the nhs and I, I, to be honest i don't think it's going to be available anytime soon for a gp no. uh you know to be able to prescribe but what what kind of things do people come in that you've seen you know you know what kind of conditions does cannabis help so, with? um so by far the most common conditions that are being prescribed for in the uk are pain conditions mm. usually a chronic form of pain like long-term pain uh lots of fibromyalgia mm. i've seen a lot of like connective tissue like elos danlos and mm. things like that right people do really well often with mm. medical cannabis who, who suffer with that um there's a strong link with like fibro and hyper um mobility and mm. connective tissues and disorders and things like that seen a lot of that chronic pain fibromyalgia chronic fatigue 
long COVID's quite a good one. Mm. Lots of patients kind of been accessing the clinics for that, that reason. And then lots and lots of mental health disorders. So mm. probably got an equal number of, or possibly more psychiatrists than any other specialty working in this field and pain consultants. Mm. They're probably the two biggest groups. So psychiatrists often prescribing for uh, anxiety, insomnia, PTSD, and then uh, conditions like, um, so no, those are probably the main ones. And then you've got the sort of neurological, more specialist things like mm. neurological conditions like epilepsy, Parkinson's, agitation and dementia, uh, some of the things that might be associated with autism like anxiety and uh, behavioral issues and things like that. So mm. kind of case specific, but I'd say by far, far and large, the most, most of the conditions that are being prescribed for are either a form of chronic pain or a common kind of mental health condition mm. like anxiety or what about ADHD slash autism? Uh, yeah, I've seen, I personally, I've seen a lot of patients do quite well with medical cannabis. Um, obviously, you know, the, with autism, you're treating the symptom of the autism, mm. right? So like, and the anxiety that can manifest from autism is slightly different to like a primary diagnosis of autism in like a neurotypical mm. person. Um, it's a slightly different form of, of anxiety or behavioral change if you have an underlying diagnosis of autism. Mm. There's quite a few studies that have been done in adolescents who are suffering with some of the behavioral challenges around autism, whether it's like anxiety or uh, behavioral disturbances, insomnia, um, who have responded really well to medical cannabis. Mm. Um, but obviously that's kind of quite a niche area. But personally, yeah, I have seen and treated like patients who have some of those diagnoses in the background who are responding well to medical cannabis. Mm. I think as ADHD, you know, and also one, another one of those conditions where if you get diagnosed with it, the, the, the treatment is not very nice, you know, the medication, you know, um, and so it's interesting that you say that because again, it's another thing that people kind of, you know, ask about another one that I've heard a lot of people ask about, and I don't know if it's a restless legs. I don't know whether, oh, yeah, you, yeah. I don't know what, you know, that, cause again, it can be, so people think, oh, it's just your leg moving, but this can be like really serious. Like people can, can't sleep. It can cause, yeah. and that can lead to the anxiety, depression, Oh, and, yeah. and it's like a really nasty condition where, again, the medication we, we use to help with that is not very nice. Um, and it doesn't so always work. We use, for that. We use a dope... Uh, yeah, like rapinarol or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, which is dopamine agonist. So That's anti, a quite a nasty yeah, it's not, drug. Yeah, 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 it's not very nice. So it's, it's almost left to a very large resort. And even then, it does not. it's not that effective at times. Yeah. But is there any evidence of, of, of it working? Or have you seen it working? I've seen it, rest, yeah. restless legs. Yeah. yeah, I've seen some patients with that in in their diagnosis yeah yeah because theoretically it, 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 going back to the, the system it almost makes sense right if it if yeah. it if rest legs are down to an overactive you know uh system you know if they are deficient you know then this would topping them up would almost yeah. settle them down and help with with the rest yeah, of yeah, legs. definitely worth trying yeah um but going back to the kind of asd or autism one thing about cannabis right, especially when you start prescribing it, is a very bespoke treatment. It's mm. like very personalized. So someone yeah. might find that a particular strain isn't working for them or a particular format. The main ways it's prescribed in the UK are sublingual oils, drop mm. under the tongue, flour to be vaporized. There's some capsules and um, that, uh, that are coming to market and maybe transdermal, but they're not commonly used at the, mm. at the moment. So it's mainly an oil or a flour. But I saw someone recently who took them a while to find it He's got, he's ASD, uh, ADHD, and has found two flower strains that really work for him. Mm. He's like life-changing. He said, I can focus my thoughts, you know, I can get on my day, I can work. People around him don't recognize him. He's so high-functioning. Mm. Tolerates it incredibly well. He's come off lots of, I think he's come off the stimulant meds as well, or very much minimized those. Because as you say, they're not very well tolerated, and they they're probably more risky to prescribe than cannabis like mm. i would i'm more cautious around that type of medication than i am with medical cannabis yeah so, so what kind of so you say that example there what how does it normally work so someone comes in i'm guessing you give like a is it like a like almost like a pathway you give like a generic version or a generic strain is it or a yeah, first line try so 
because the plant and the products are complex, there's like hundreds of active cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids. There's all these things in it. Mm. Um, make it simple for ourselves. So generally, we think of it in three groups. High THC product, mm. balanced product, which is like a one-to-one ratio of THC to CBD mm-hmm. and, a high TA- and a high CBD product. Mm. So a typical combination might be to start someone on a, it depends, it's very case specific, but say commonly I might put someone on a high THC oil for nighttime mm-hmm. that you titrate up very slowly. So it might be like a 20 to one ratio of THC to CBD. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're starting at tiny amounts and you're slowly building up. So that might help with sleep and pain overnight, especially it's good for you know somnia or conditions with like fibro where patients might find their pains to send their sleep mm. daytime because of the sedative effects of thc you might want to put someone on a high cbd or a balanced oil mm. again build it up very slowly if it's not working yeah you think about putting introducing flour so uh, the oils often work kind of long acting as a sort of baseline background medication that you can build up slowly but the flour might be really helpful for like breakthrough pain or mm. breakthrough anxiety like shorter acting but a quicker effect there's new products coming to market um uh, in the forms of like vape pens and things where you could have a bit more of a meter dose which Mm. is going to be quite useful so yeah it was still fairly crude the way we prescribe but um i think as the companies kind of invest more in research and delivery methods like we'll get much kind of more targeted treatments and meter treatments and things like that Mm. it's quite a kind of loose way of prescribing and I'm very much directed by the patients as well. I kind of mm. say to them, like, you can slowly titrate it up. So you notice any side effects just come down. Mm. Common side effects might be things like dry mouth. Um, what else do you get? So a bit of over sedation or they might feel a bit groggy in the mornings. <coughs> um, probably worth mentioning some of the kind of parameters around that. So like anyone who's had like unstable heart disease, like a recent heart attack or stroke. Mm. You, you really kind of want to avoid THC mm. containing because that can increase the heart rate a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are very few, like we wouldn't prescribe for anyone pregnant or breastfeeding. Yeah, uh, Ages can obviously be an issue as well. But um, yeah, and any kind of risk of psychosis or first degree relative, very strong family history, you definitely want to avoid THC containing products. Um, and uh, and are, they, are these kind of lifelong treat lifelong treatments, or can patients go in for like in a couple of like you know a six month and almost titrate off to see if yeah, or can, is it kind of something they stay on forever? Um, I think it's case specific. A lot of people, I think, find it works so well they don't want to come off it. Mm. Um, but it's kind of trial and error, really. Uh, you know, I sometimes say to people, well, you can try a few months off and see if you know if things. Uh, return to how they were or you know but what it kind of allows sometimes is for patients to focus on other aspects of their life so they can get fit again or they can you know get back to healthy eating or weight loss and good sleep and so on and maybe kind of come down a little bit on the medication Mm. but yeah I mean some in some cases you know you do end up with patients that just want to be on it long term because they find it helps them so much 